the maturity of that. It's, um, it's the um, it's who it's who it's what we do with the material, isn't it? Um, and, and Beth, you've heard from Beth, who coordinates the hub. What a difficult job that is, <laughs> but uh, um, but she's doing a brilliant job. And then we've got um, Ruby Wright, who's us in residence and has produced a book for, for primary schools on plastic waste that's gone out to more than 500 schools. Uh, Danielle, we're going to hear of uh, soon, very soon, about the big compost experiment. Miguel is a material flow analysis expert. Uh, and I think I've mentioned, I haven't mentioned Francisca, who's who's an institute or who's the director of the Institute of Finance and Technology. And of course, the, the, the economic incentives of the system, and we do need systems change, um, is one of the big ponderables here. And we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. But so Francisco is leading on that work. And I haven't mentioned Teresa on her material flow analysis, but that's also, she, she and Miguel work together on that. And they have some amazing new data sets, but we'll talk about that in future webinars. Today, we're gonna to concentrate on compostable and biodegradable plastics. So yeah, next slide, please, Danielle. Yeah, so just to show you how we're going to, uh, how the webinar is structured. So we, we just had the introduction. <laughs> I'm going to hand on in a, in a minute to uh, Danielle, who's going to talk us through the big compost experiment first year results. Um, and, and essentially, uh, this was an experiment which we started a year ago on a citizen science experiment, encouraging citizens throughout the UK to put home compostable packaging into their compost bins. We recognize right from the beginning that every compost bin is different and the people who manage them are different. And so we were really interested to see what the results would throw up. And this is a, this is a sort of different way of approaching whether something will or won't compost because they may or may not, these packaging um, conform to certain standards. But the question is, do they actually compost in practice? And Danielle will, will talk about that in a minute. After that, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll switch gears and we'll talk about systems analysis of the whole system, which is where we, we, we feel uh, a, a concentration of research effort needs to go. And we're gonna show you a little bit about our systems analysis of compostables and biodegradables in the UK and some policy recommendations, which we have are publishing today about what we think the government should do. And then uh, after that, we'll talk about this research project, which we've just won from the Natural Environmental Research Council to put actually some of those research questions into practice. Like, let's go and find out how to make a sustainable system for compostable, uh, compostable packaging in the UK. And then we'll take question and answers. So uh, I will hand over to Danielle to tell you about the big compost experiment. Thanks, Thanks Danielle. Mark. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Just thumbs up from anyone who's, yeah. Okay, um, so um, yes, as Mark was saying, I'm just gonna introduce you to where we're at at our 12 months um, of analysis of the big compost experiment data. Um, just starting off with a, a quick recap of the two main categories of compostable plastics that we're really talking about in our research. Um, so compostable plastics are, are either designed to be home compostable in a home composting process or industrially compostable using one of the industry, industrial compostable routes. Um, it could be open window composting, it could be in vessel composting or anaerobic digestion. Um, and these are the kind of main differences to highlight. So when we're talking about the big compost experiment, um, we're really interested to see uh, what, what data we can actually gather and what information we can find out about the behavior of these home compostable plastics in home compost. Um, so this is where you can find the website. Um, so, so the method that we chose to use was um, a website people can take part. Um, it's based on citizen science principles, so um, about widening public engagement with this topic, um, actually getting people um, and our wonderful citizen science, scientists out there to, to actually sort of help us gather this information because it's incredibly difficult to get hold of um, in the real world. Um, and then the main aims of it being to try and assess sort of current opinions and behavior towards these materials and really get an idea of how they're performing currently. So our method um, was sort of basically two main parts to this method. And the first step to take part is to, to go to the website and take part in our survey. And that's really questions about your opinion and behavior around these materials. 
Um, and then the second part is um, if someone or a participant wants to take part in home composting experiment, they can sign up, select some suitable materials, so compost uh, materials that are identified as compostable, home compostable, or they have any of the certification markings for um, home compostable plastics on them. Um, pop them in their composters, log um, how long they're going to, to test them for, so what their composting duration is, and then at the end of that period, when they're ready to dig up their compost, have a look for the items or any traces of items that might remain in them and um, pop some information and photographs of those on the website. Um, and the other main thing to sort of highlight is uh, participants are given a, a range of uh, degradation scale to, to choose from to try and compare their item results to. And this isn't in order for us to be able to understand better how these materials are kind of ending up, what, the, what their performance is in, in a composter. Um, so to summarize our uh, survey information, um, it's been very interesting to have a look through responses from this. Um, an overview of, of uh, responses to this question of are participants more likely to buy things that are marked compostable biodegradable. And we have an overwhelming 84% that said yes, um, which is indicating that in, in the sort of in general public terms, there is an interest and there is a popularity of these materials. Um, and so this is also something that as researchers, we think is very interesting to, to know because we would like to know a bit more detail about why those materials are more favorable. So what are the kind of key actors or factors that um, mean that a participant is very interested in, in using or buying these materials. Um, so then when, um, when asked about where, if, if you do compost at home or you separate your food waste, where would you put biodegradable compostable plastics to dispose of it? We had an interesting set of results. So 43% of participants said that they dispose of the um, compostable plastics in their home composters, um, with a, a lower 15% actually disposing them in council waste collection. Um, this is kind of interesting at the moment because of um, the difference in council waste collection provided in different areas in the UK. Uh, it's also interesting to note that um, because of the um, environment bill and um, the target to mandate um, household food collection by 2023, that this is kind of an interesting sort of proposition here that we might see a shift in the way that people potentially might dispose of plastics. Um, but it's interesting to know nonetheless where, where they're sort of currently being put. Um, so participants can also send in some amazing images um, of their composting um, methods. So we can see a really, a really interesting range here of, of types of unit where they're placed um, and also subsequent methods. So the way in which someone uses their compost and um, how long they compost for, for instance. So in answer to a few of, of, of these bits of, um, so these questions, um, when we asked what kind of compost people, people use, we found out that people often use more than one type. So sometimes they're using composters in combination with another. Um, the overwhelming majority um, favour outdoor closed bin composters. Um, they're sort of similar to the type of compost bins that you can buy subsidised through council websites. Um, so that's an interesting range of um, these, these types of bin being used um, and containers. So we've also got um, a, a wide range of biodiversity uh, being recorded in composters um, all around the UK as well. And this is, this is pretty interesting and also quite essential to, to sort of note that, that we have a connection here now between um, biodiversity um, in the garden potentially and um, with the materials that we're disposing of in them. So this is a sort of a high level kind of understanding of what we might find there. Um, and then this is the sort of range of, of items that people have selected to test. Um, it's a very interesting kind of range of uh, objects, product types, packaging, different structures. Um, and when we start to have a look at some of the kind of uh, information that we get behind this, so what kind of polymers are uh, present in some of the materials and the objects that are being tested, 
you can see there's actually quite an interesting range um, from what we could identify. Um, things like cellulose polymers, we've got um, polylactic acids, PLAs, um, and things like starch-based polymers, so things that are derived from things like potato starch or corn starch. Um, and it's also interesting to note that the variety um, of these polymer types and the blends is very much to do with the performance of them in use. So the, the structure and the performance needed by um, different types of objects or, or a hot drink cup versus a tea bag versus a shopping bag means that, that various types of blends are being used in order to try and achieve some of those performance characteristics. Um, so we've got um, a, uh, an interesting, also an interesting side to this um, data, which is about being able to sort of have a look at how well people are understanding or interpreting um, the labeling on some of these materials. Um, and we took a sort of sample set of um, images just to sort of have a look at how participants were kind of understanding and identifying a, a home compostable piece of plastic. And it seems that there's, there's quite a degree of confusion. Um, so with roughly around 14% um, uh, of our sample set were showing um, industrial composting standards on them. So it means that, that there is a little bit of confusion to, in order to identify these products and packaging in the first place. Um, and when we move on to some of the results that we're getting in, we've got about 402 uh, item results so far, and the study is definitely ongoing. So we're going to be getting more, more data points and more results back from people as the year progresses. Um, and this is just a sort of breakdown of what we're, uh, what we're achieving at the moment. So as a sort of high level summary, out of um, all of the items results that we've received, 69% of the items uh, were, were reported as entirely tapped or, or partially degraded. Um, so conversely, 31% of the items were no longer visible or not found within uh, a home composter's composting timeframes. Um, and we've also got um, an interesting set of uh, va variation in terms of composting duration. So participants who, who choose to compost for three months, six months or nine months, we have had a selection of results back for all of those composting durations. Um, and we can see that there's a similar pattern emerging, even though um, this is still the first year and, and only 402 results so far. But there's, there is a kind of a, a statistical pattern emerging between three, six and nine months. So showing that there are some issues with degrading those items fully um, in those composting timeframes. Um, and this is a breakdown of the results, um, because composters sometimes compost at different times of year, and so our participants were allowed to, to kind of re reflect that behaviour in the way that they, they took part in experiments. So we've got people who started a three-month compost experiment in November, for instance. We've got someone who started a three-month um, experiment in possibly in March or April time. So this is a summary of, of how that breaks down over the year. Um, and I think it's really... Um, early, two early days to actually sort of get a full idea of how the, this, these results and um, these items are performing over the full year because we're still getting slowly getting results back now even after our first year running the experiment so this is sort of just a kind of snapshot of work in progress really and um, we can see that there's a sort of variety of, of results coming back um, with items not degrading or not found over um, yeah, several of the months of the year so that therefore seasonal change um, is is not presenting any kind of um, I don't know uh, answers really to this yet um, so we'll have to watch this space and um, see where, where more of the data will take take this analysis um, so then this is a this is a sort of a breakdown of the results according to their types. Um, so we've had so far the most um, items tested in the newspaper magazine wrap category. Um, and we can see that there's still sort of a 74% uh, still finding bits or entirely tapped bits of their items um, in, in their compost. 
it's also interesting to see statistically we've got a similar results distribution happening over um, several other categories. So canning bin bags, shopping bags, um, fruit and veg films, for instance. Um, and this is a breakdown of those results regionally. Um, and we've, we're showing some, some interesting, um, interesting results that even though England and Scotland, for instance, have um, generally have quite different climates, uh, we're actually sort of seeing some similar results in terms of um, items not fully degrading um, in composting time frames. So in summary, um, what we're really showing at the moment is that there is um, a, a sort of um, an issue, I guess, with the biodegradation of compostable plastics in home composting settings. Um, and some of them, the main issues seem to be at the moment that um, things may be starting to degrade, but they're not degrading fully within home composting timeframes, which as we can see, some people compost in as, as quickly as three months or six months. Um, this also then uh, suggests at the moment that there is an issue with the standard home compost certifications available out there um, and their timeframes generally rely on a 12 month test duration to, to, to sort of break down an item. So this suggests that potentially that, that the certification criteria uh, need to be uh, looked at or reformed in order to sort of cater and represent true home composting uh, timeframes. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of significant confusion around the labelling and instructions for compostable plastic packaging and this also affects the identification of industrially compostable materials as well um, and is uh, something that we'll talk about in more detail in the, in the following slides um, when we introduce our next steps for our research. Um, but also the finally to sort of say that the study is definitely ongoing. So if anyone is currently taking part, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing your results. And also if anyone else wants to start a home compost experiment or sign up to take a say, please do. Um, the website details will be at the end of the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Mark and Jenny as well. Thanks, Danielle. Um, okay, so now we're going to just talk about um, sort of zoom out a bit from home composting into compostable plastics in general and the biodegradable sector and just tell you what we found when we did a systems analysis of the whole sector and, and how we translated that into, a, into a, some policy recommendations which we have been trying to feed into government. Um, so, so as Danielle really just showed, I mean, in terms of home composting, what we identify really is that there's a huge range of home composting environments across the UK, everyone's back garden and how they, and, and as I look at the data so far, what I see is it really does depend on the person uh, who's, who's managing that compost and, and, and the way in which it's compost is managed. So there's an enormous number of variables there and it's really difficult for someone designing a material that will degrade in a certain time frame across all of those environments. It's almost an impossible task. Um, and, uh, but there are some polymer blends out there that, that seem to be doing a better job than others. And so, of course, what we want to do is try and work out why some are successful and some are less successful. Um, there's also clearly confusion. Um, and so people don't know whether they should, um, they should, you know, where to put them. And so what, what, what we, currently see is that in the UK, there is no, there is no system for, uh, you know, to, for, for collection of compostable plastics. And if people aren't going to put them into the home compost, where do they put them? Some companies out there will do a, a collection service and, and process them themselves, but that, that is a minority. At the moment, they're sort of, the compostable plastics end up on the market, they go into everybody's homes, and then really the only place if people are not going to home compost them or if they can't home compost them because not, not the majority of people in the UK don't home compost. Also, many of these plastics are actually only industrially compostable, so they shouldn't be put in the home compost anyway, as we've seen also from those results. So they, they're then sort of forced to put them into the, into the bin for landfill and incineration. And this, this is not a good outcome. This is not the desired outcome 
um, for sustainable compostable and biodegradable plastics uh, sector. So what we, what we uh, would like to see, if you go to the next slide, thanks Danielle, is, is a system for manufacture and collection, sorting and composting of these compostable plastics. And how, how would that look? Well, we've kind of, we've, we've sort of sketched it out here. They get, they get, they, they come out of biomass uh, um, and then they go into chemical engineering where they're made into polymers. Uh, they turn up, they, they, they become compostable plastics with particular properties to protect the products that they're designed to protect and package. They then go into people's lives. Then the labeling, we really need to do something about the labeling because people don't really understand where to put them. And, and if, we, we, if we have a system that we've designed for, then those plastics, it, it ought to be clear on the, on, on the, on the packaging where citizens put that packaging. There then needs to be a way in which they're disposed and collected. And, and if this is part of a, a, um, a, a mixed collection, then they'll need to be sorted and identified. And that technology at the moment is also unclear. Um, if they go into food waste collection at the moment, they're mostly separated and, and either burnt or landfilled in the UK. And this again is, is not an ideal situation. And, and, and people are confused about that too. And as we go towards uh, a fully UK-wide food collection service to all households, it's gonna be more and more urgent that we clarify that situation. Then ideally they would go to composting and they would be fully compostable and end up back helping the soil become more biodiverse. But we also know that if they do get composted, what we get is we get sequestration of carbon in the soil so this is from an environmental point of view, very, very beneficial, much more beneficial than being landfilled or incinerated. And of course it then can fertilize the soil. So the ideal system as we see it is sketched out here, but where we put the pound signs is where we've also identified that there's a kind of economic disadvantage for um, companies operating the system in terms of waste processing companies, but also the producers uh, where money needs to be put in in order for these things to happen, for them to be economically viable, and where will that money come from? So we need some sort of reform of the PRN system, which we'll get on to. So next slide, please. So we've, we've kind of encapsulated these, these kind of conclusions of what a system needs to look like in the UK for it to be viable and to, for it to be sustainable. And we, we, we put them together into a, into a policy document. I'll hand over to Jenny to talk us through how at UCL we try and translate the science and engineering into policy. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see so many people here this afternoon. Um, yes, just, just to give a very quick um, overview of my role um, in the team. So, um, as Mark mentioned, I head up the uh, policy impact unit um, for UCL's engineering faculty. And um, what my team does is to work with, with researchers um, like the, the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub team to help make sure that the findings from that research finds its way onto the desks of, of decision makers in government and parliament and, and elsewhere. Um, with the, the, the intention really of making sure that policy is, is informed by evidence. And so one of the ways that we, we do that is by working with researchers to produce um, policy briefings that summarise the research findings and set out clearly for policymakers what we think the next steps uh, need to be. So we're very pleased today to be publishing uh, this policy briefing and it's available on the website. So uh, after the webinar, please do, do go and take a look. You can download it from, from the website here on the screen. Um, and we're going to be sharing this with with a, with a range of policymakers who are working in this area, and we hope that will be the start of some fruitful conversations. Um, and I also just wanted to mention the fact we're, we're very um, excited to be working on this project at the moment because, as I'm sure a lot of, of people will know, there's, there's a lot going on at the moment. Thanks, Danielle. Um, in in the kind of in in government um, thinking about waste and resources. Um, quite broadly, so I'm sure some of this will be familiar to, to people here. So um, 
I'm sure you will have heard about the, the ban on single use plastics that's come in recently. Uh, there's also the environment bill that's going through Parliament at the moment, and, and one of the outcomes of that will be uh, that the government is going to set a long term target um, on waste resource, and it'll be a le legally binding target. Um, and so the next two years are going to be a process of developing what that target should look like. Um, and so I think that's a really important opportunity for projects like this to, to really get involved with that process to make sure that that target will help to, to move forward this agenda and make sure that compostable plastics can be part of a sustainable system. Um, there's lots of other things coming in too. Um, so as has been mentioned, there's the, the plan to roll out food waste collection to all homes by 2023. Um, and there's some longer term ambitions as, as well around um, eliminating avoidable plastic waste and all waste um, by 2050. So there's quite, there's quite a sort of, um, I think, fertile context for this work. And um, we're, we're really looking forward to being part of that. Um, in the next stage of the project, which which I think you'll hear about now. So um, I'm going to hand back over to, I think, Danielle to, to tell you more about that. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, so just as another um, output from our um, compostables research at the moment, um, it, it was sort of becoming clear that there are a lot of companies, manufacturers, also citizens just getting in touch with us and um, having a similar range of questions about about these materials, so problems with identification of them, um, issues around um, how to deal with them, what to, to what to make of them, whether they should be sort of investing in them or not. And really we wanted to try and consolidate all of those questions and responses into a guide, um, which just sort of sets out um, our, our kind of research view um, in terms of what the sort of current best practice for these materials should be. Um, and, and the fact that we're also aware as researchers that there is um, a, a fair bit of data that we just don't have on some of the performance end of things, um, which would really need to be carried out before, um, I think that before recommend, re making recommendations to sort of wholesale switch towards these materials happens. So this is um, a guide that you can have a look at that's available through the Big Compost Experiment website, um, which just sets out um, the, the path towards this research and some of these questions. Um, yeah, so just to, to sort of summarize this section about our, our policy, um, uh, Danny, do you want me to just sort of summarize for you or would you like to just quickly wrap up? No, do, do, do go ahead, Danny. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so to summarize, um, basically, uh, trying uh, to set a government target for when the UK recycling system will be able to rep replace um, sort of process compostable plastics. Um, secondly, uh, we need to develop a roadmap towards de delivering the goal. And um, the common questions for this will be, will existing food waste collection systems be adapted to accommodate compostable plastics? How will the required infrastructure be funded? Um, and also, what the plans and how we should develop labelling and standards to ensure citizens can clearly use the system once it's in place. And those are sort of the important parts of this roadmap towards delivering that goal. Um, and government really should work with industry to develop the, this labelling code of practice and to ensure correct disposals so to find a system that works both in terms of citizen perception, behaviour and understanding, but also can work with some of the commercial pressures um, that manufacturers and um, businesses face also to work with um, stakeholders like um, the industrial composting businesses and anaerobic digesters to understand what will work with them as well. Um, so that's in summary where we're going with policy recommendations. So next steps. Sorry, yes, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Danielle. Okay, so next step. So we, we put all this together, uh, this the system analysis and the early results of the compost experiment, and we and we applied for some research money from the Natural Environmental Research Council as part of the uh, Smart uh, and Sustainable pa Plastic Packaging um, initiative run by UKRI. And we were, we were successful in, in getting that research money. So we now have a research project that will go from 2021 to 2024 
and we just wanted to talk to you a bit about um, the the objectives of that that, that research program. Uh, also, sh sh um, describe how to get involved if you want to, both individuals and, and companies, and also to to say thank you and and show you who is already involved. Um, so we so I mean I'm sort of repeating myself a bit because. <laughs> But uh, essentially, the objectives are to try and investigate these questions that we identified earlier in, in the analysis. So objective one is, what is the environmental impact of industrial and home composting? So two questions there, really. Uh, you know, can, can, we, can we show the benefit uh, of the home composting sector to the environment? Like, and how do you get that benefit? If you don't, you have to have a system in place, obviously, so that they actually get composted. But, but what, are, what are then the benefits so that it can be clear to government and policymakers what they would be legislating to increase. Um, can we improve the effectiveness of industrial home composting? So at the moment, uh, many anaerobic digesters, most in the, ECU, in the UK, which treat food waste, cannot treat the biodegradable plastics, or at least they're not set up to do it so at the moment. Can, can, we, can we help create, uh, investigate the conditions inside anaerobic digesters uh, to make them more amenable to biodegradable plastics um, and, and, and to accelerate their degradation in that environment, similarly in industrial composting and in vessel composting. And so this is, this is careful lab work, which, which Helen will talk about in a minute. Can we, can we, we know that we need to understand about sorting and detection technologies. At various stages in the system, we're gonna to need to be able to differentiate between compostable and non-compostable plastics as they go through the system. So we need to work out how to do that. And we've got partners who are going to help us do that and test out that technology. A labeling and identification that we've already discovered that people are confused who are, even the people who are really interested and, and, and enthusiastic are confused. And then there's a whole lot of people who are not interested and not enthusiastic and they are, are <laughs> well, you know, who knows what they think, but we need to be very clear where these things should go uh, and, and what their, what their disposal route is. And so, trying to get together everyone in the system, producers, manufacturers, brand owners, waste manufacturers, citizens, to understand what that packaging and labeling should look like so it actually works, does the job it should do. Um, and objective five is uh, to try and work out, I mean, RAP have already done some great work on, on trying to differentiate which products in the market are best suited at the moment to, to biodegrading and which ones are best suited to recycling and reuse. But we, but we think there's much more work to be done there. There are lots of product categories actually that are sort of, in a sense, have been left to their own devices. Uh, and, and, and wipes comes to mind, uh, very highly used um, product type, which people are confused about. And, and um, so trying to work out what the best disposal method and, and product and ingredients for, for wipes should be is, now, uh, is also part of our uh, remit. And, um, and, 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 and behavior change. So, so how, do, how does all of this affect behavior change? How can we get people to, um, to in a sense, buy in clearly and, and do the, the, the uh, be, able to, be able to kind of uh, navigate this system clearly? So yes, that's, that's the research in the nutshell. Uh, and we'll just talk a little bit more about um, some parts of it. Um, oh yeah, before I say that, well, we, 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 we spent a lot of time and effort trying to get everyone in the system around the table. Well, we will get them all around the table. At the moment, it's been sort of one-to-one -one conversations about this. Uh, and we recognize that there's many other organizations out there who are also doing this. And the idea is not to sort of, we're not, we're trying to kind of, in a sense, add, add to the clarity of this sector and help, help differentiate the evidence and create new evidences. But we thank all these companies and organizations who've, uh, who've already got involved with us and as I say, they span the whole, the whole system. And I, th I think that's the really important thing because there's going to, if we, we can't get one part of the thing working for one bit of the system, if it doesn't work for the other bit of the system, both financially and in terms of material composition, degradation, and so on. So it, it, it's, it's a systems approach and it, it has lots of different um, organizations involved. And we'll be meeting with them. And yeah, and how do we work? We work. Well, I mean, across these different boundaries of public policy, innovation. So the innovation is, is what Helen's going to talk about in a minute, about how we get, um, 
you know, the, the enzyme degradation bacteria working better on these things? How do we increase the success rate of, of biodegradation and composting? Um, and also innovation in terms of how do we get automatic sorting to work? We've got systems change, I've just talked about that. I mean, that's such an important thing, trying to get everyone around the table and trying to understand the, uh, the levers, both economic and, and in terms of design principles and public policy. So Jenny was talking about that. How do we, how do we bring policymakers right in from the beginning and understand their, their concerns and worries? So that in a nutshell is how we, we're gonna manage the project and make sure that everyone is, is involved. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll hand over to Helen now to talk a bit about the chemistry and biochemistry because I think I've talked about the materials design behavior and the policy and regulation. Okay, thanks Mark. And hopefully my video is working okay. Um, Danielle, can you forward on the slides? Is that okay, Helen? Okay, and is the video okay? Yep, can see your video. Okay. Excellent. Clear. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, myself and John Ward, we're going to be looking at some practical aspects of the project. And in particular, what we're going to be looking at is a selection of polymers. Now, the major biodegradable polymers, they're shown there. Um, but they're broadly the polylactates, the polyhydroxy alkanoates, and both of those are bio-derived. And of course, you've got other uh, biodegradable polymers such as the polysaccharides, but we're going to be concentrating on the PLAs and the PHAs. Um, there are other biodegradable polymers that are used, for example, PBAT that's uh, mentioned there, that's used in um, making plastic cups and PBS is used in agriculture as well. And of course, many materials may have mixtures of these, of these uh, biodegradable polymers in them. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at some of the bioprocessing options. And these will be, as Mark has mentioned, some industrial composting, an aerobic process, and also anaerobic processes uh, using anaerobic digesters. And we're also going to be looking at the combinations where um, these are used together. And we're going to see how we can combine this, this with other pretreatments that could ultimately um, aid in helping us deal with how we can break down these um, biodegradable polymers. Ultimately, of course, we're wanting to be able to degrade uh, these polymers in the presence of food waste, and that's something that really hasn't been explored, and we want to be able to establish what the parameters are in this, in this project. So, Danielle, have you got a, a thank you very much? Um, so, how are we going to do this? Um, broadly, we have a scheme shown on the right, and we're going to select initially PLA and PBAT as example plastics, and we're going to be looking at them through the use of aerobic processes, anaerobic, ana aerobic, and then anaerobic, and we're going to be looking at the degradation of these materials. But particle size is also important if we're looking at breaking down plastic. So we're also going to be combining pretreatments such as milling. Then what we will be doing is, as well as looking at how the material degrades, we're going to be looking at what's the microbial consortia that are present? How long does it take to be stabilised um, when these plastics are being broken down? Um, and we will look at that with both aerobic and anaerobic conditions as um, the, is highlighted on the slide. Now, important, thank you very much, with this is um, we're going to be doing some DNA sequencing on the, um, the material, the compost, uh, the materials that are, is produced as we're breaking down some of these um, plastics. And by extracting the DNA and sequencing this and looking at um, the microbiome that's present, the num the, all the different microbes, this will help inform us on what species, what microbes are good to have under various different scenarios for breaking down um, in the presence of, of, of food waste. And we'll look
look at the bioration of materials, how um, physically these break down, how they break down chemically, and then how the components that are formed are able to um, uh, form the biomass products. And we will assess various different combinations of this and work uh, with our collaborators that are on board in the project to have a lot of these can then operate in, in industrial um, uh, composting or anaerobic digester scenarios. And we can use enriched inocula from uh, a result of the experiments that we've got. And then we can look at extending it to the PHAs. And we can also use this to inform us um, as to how we think about maybe the best sort of scenarios that we might be able to have for some of the, of the home composting. Um, so Danielle, that's um, I think a brief summary of what we're going to be looking at. Great, thanks Helen. Okay, I think that's... Um our um, sort of slides and presentation um, bit done and now we're into we've got about 15 minutes now for q a um best i wondered whether you had um spotted some questions that we could pose to the team yeah so we've had lots of um great questions and um some of the attendees are answering each other's questions which is lovely um there are sort of categories of questions and also there's been sort of um some people have liked um various questions so i think a good way to manage this i don't think we're going to be able to get to every one of the current 58 um open questions would be um firstly if you feel that your question has been answered through the presentation um or through an answer um if you could dismiss your question or delete your question that would be great um as well if you can like other people's questions um that's great because that brings them to the top of the q a uh the q a box um so i think what i will do is i will start with um i'll just start with the ones at the top and then um if we see sort of sort of if we're answering the questions sort of in, in sort of topic areas then we might sort of move on um to uh to other topics so um there the, the initial questions all came in about the home composting so um danielle will keep you uh will sort of put this to you um so okay. we've had 16 likes for Jillian's question. Have you consulted with hardcore gardeners? Gardeners um, world often say a minimum of 12 months to get good quality compost um, for your garden independent of, of compostable plastics. So the 12 month time scale for the home composting test may be realistic, um, but we may um, there may be a need to educate consumers on how best to compost. I wondered if you could um, respond to that one. Um, I think it's a it's an interesting question. Um, it's also, um, I suppose it's, it's the, the, the first thing I would say is that, that, that anyone who's taken part, um, we have a, a range of people who have self-selected themselves to take part in this. And so um, what's interesting about that is that it's, it's probably more representative of the range of awareness and ability and um, access to composting out there. Um, so um, it's interesting to sort of think about um, if, uh, there are programs, organizations which can or have the ability to promote a very efficient composting processes. Um, I'm not sure that it's, it's in fact reasonable to, to, to sort of assume that we could change people's composting practices across the UK in order that they would sufficiently um, process these materials that are, are kind of finding their way into compost bins at the moment. So I think that there's a sort of, there's, there's kind of a couple of issues with, with that. Um, we have um, been uh, in contact with several um, gardening organisations, so for instance, um, Garden Organic, um, and we've, we've spoken to them about some of the, the kind of similar issues that they've seen with um, use of home compostable plastics in uh in their experience on, on talking to their um, members um but yeah so i think in, in sort of summary that that we are aware that there are there are different practices and i think as a researcher i'm respectful of the fact that people have a different approach and it's also and it also suggests that there are a range of conditions which people are composting in around the country and they do vary quite 
uh, widely, as we can see in some of the photos and in some of the data that we're getting back. Um, so even, even if we sort of approached um, educating people to compost in a particular way because it's incredibly efficient or creates a very aggressive environment for materials to be processed in, um, you still have the challenge of things like geographical or weather um, uh, differences in those um, different compost bins. I hope that I hope that answers or helps with that question. Great, thanks. Um, and then we have a question from Helen um, Parker that says that, um, this may be too simple a question, but how can we be certain plastics are broken down to elements and not just to particles large enough to cause problems, but too small to remove and reuse? And um, Jane follows that up by saying the main question is what is still left in the soil and taken up by my veggies. So um, maybe we could bring in John to comment on this and then maybe Mark, um, you might have something to say afterwards. John, are you there? I'm here, yeah. My video is um, not active. It's been turned off by the host. Oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, I can answer that. Um, we will be doing particle analysis to see what size of particles are left after certain lengths of time throughout the <clears throat> test. Uh, this is on the new NERC project that we've got. So we'll be looking at the particle size as, it, uh, as things degrade and also on the chemical release of uh, the monomers, the little constituents of these uh, biodegradable and, or any polymer. It's made of repeating monomer units and we can then assay to see whether those are released but those are literally food sources and they are naturally occurring food sources for bacteria soil bacteria so things like lactic acid um, uh, the polylactates are made of those that break down to lactic acid which is I mean we eat that in all kinds of fermented foods bacteria in the soil will eat that so generally those then become part of the natural soil biomass in the same way as when we put uh, leaves and grass into a compost heap, eventually they break down into a whole variety of things. Nothing breaks down completely, and that's why you're ending up with uh, humus, the material that you want to use on the soil again. And so that's really what these um, uh, biodegradable natural plas um, biopolymers will degrade to. A lot of it will be completely degraded. Others will be assimilated into bacteria and just become part of their biomass. And there will probably be a small amount of material left, which just becomes the, the general uh, material that soil is made of. Is that an answer? Yeah, that's great. And I think that actually addresses um, one of the other, um, the next most like question, which is what value does combustible plastics add to a compost? Um, or is it just a disposal route for the material? Um, so I think you've... Um, yeah, it does, it does add to the soil. In the same way as if you put on um, sort of shredded up cardboard and newspaper, that's cellulose, maybe a bit of lignin in the um, uh, cardboard. That is, it's just like a bit of refined twigs and leaves. Uh, but eventually is cellulose will be eaten by cellulitic bacteria, just in the same way as leaves and grass and other kinds of um, natural plant material would, and then it becomes indistinguishable and so that the same way as um, uh, bioplastics um, will be broken down into materials that are eventually indistinguishable from the natural stuff that's in the soil. That's great thanks. Um, and uh, a hot topic of discussion has been tea bags. Um, and should we recycle tea bags? Should we compost tea bags? Or so what should we do with tea bags? Um, and there's been some answers on the on the chat, which is lovely. But Mark, maybe you could jump in and um, just talk about tea bags for um, a few minutes. Well, I mean, so I'm not, not much to add because we haven't got that any results on our own compost experiments. But to say that. People probably know that there's there's most most um, tea bags up until recently were, were basically had a plastic reinforcement which was made of polypropylene, and people may have spotted these sort of skeleton tea bags in their compost as a result of that because that would not get ordinarily would not get broken down under any sort of great speed in in a, in a normal compost or in the soil, um, which is concerning. And when that when that news erupted last year. 
uh, it was it was news to many many people who who, who thought they were mostly paper based and therefore totally suitable for putting in their compost. And um, and many of the brands have now you know spent a lot of time trying to to move to a, to other types of polymer biopolymers, some of which uh, Helen described in her um, slides, uh, which uh, so the PLA based and uh, John was just talking about as well. Um, and I think PG tips have moved that way now. And they claim they're fully compostable. We haven't we haven't got the results to, to show that yet. But um, so so we, we, if people were up for, for for putting some of those in their compost in in enough numbers that they'd be able to then tell us uh, whether they have composted in their normal composting cycle, that would be greatly appreciated because think we still we still need that data. But do look on the side of the packets of your tea bags because um, if they don't say something like that, they're, they're almost certainly polypropylene, and they should go in the in the general waste and that will end up in the UK that will end up either in landfill or incineration. Great and, and I wonder whether Mark you might um, or Mark or Danielle might be able to comment a little bit about labeling. I know that labeling is one of the things that we're going to be working on going forward um, but is there use um, do we think there's value for example um, one of the questions um, says you know, in saying how long something might take to, to compost. Um, and, um, and also are people putting compostables plastics into the recycling bin? And so um, there's confusion around this labeling. I wonder whether Mark, maybe you might just discuss that a little bit, um, the problem with labeling and kind of where we're at with that. I mean, the data shows, well, with the big compost experiment, we, we're very, we were clearly asking people to put stuff in their compost that says home compostable and it's certified or at least it states very clearly it's home compostable even if it doesn't have a certification on it but people still put lots of other things on their compost we can see that from the data and anyone who goes to look at the big compost web, uh, website can see the data too all the data is open source you can see exactly what people are putting in and and most of it uh, is not home compostable so for me that that tells that tells a really clear story which is that even the difference between home compostable and industrial compostable is, 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 un, is difficult for people to understand at the moment. Um, and when we looked at the thematic analysis, why well, I say we, Aisha, who, who's the PhD student working on this, um, there were many, many different kind of confusions that came up and we'll, we'll probably report on that, or Aisha will report on that in, in, a, in, a, in next year so people can kind of tune into another webinar on that. But um, yeah, and then, but I think it's very difficult for the brands because uh, there isn't a consensus of how to kind of communicate and, and without a clear route out of the home, most of these things end up in the home. So where should you put them? And people, there's so much information happening that I think this is an area where we really, really do need to kind of clarify what citizens should do um, and how much, how much labeling would really help because unless there's a very, you know, two or three labels, one just says recyclable, I, not not where you are in the country and might be locally, but so it's sort of also dependent, as I see it, on, on the reform of the recycling system and labelling and the uniformity across the UK of the system. So it's slightly contingent on those issues too, which, which makes it much more difficult for compostables. Daniel, did you want to say anything on that? Um, hi, um, I, I think that it's sort of uh, slightly recapping on um, uh, the uh, part of our research which is about the identification of these materials in industrial settings as well. Um, so I think that um, the identification issue is both about citizen perception and identification. So how do you understand what piece of plastic is when you buy it and when you want to throw it away? But then there's also the kind of industrial side, which is um, when, a, when a processor needs to understand what is in their batch of, of organic waste and, and how to know what is compostable and, and what is essentially contamination that has its own slightly different challenges um, because things need to be uh, um, identified at speed often because there's a pressure to try and uh, process materials quickly. Um, so we're looking at to sort of recap that the, the, the future of this research will be to look at the, the range of technologies out there that can allow um, identification on an industrial scale. And those might be through um, infrared sensing. It might be through digital watermarks. But the, the other kind of side to this might be about just simple pigmentation or color or distinction of a material. So um, for example, there are um, 
companies, for instance, co-op have, have tried um, uh, pigmenting their bags in a particular way, and, and it has a sort of um, visual appearance to it, which may may have some possibilities in terms of identifying materials with your with your eyes. And so some of those processes, which which is which which are still human led um, and, and sometimes not done by a machine that it would allow for, for people to be able to distinguish materials more clearly through things like color, color identification, not just um, relying on small um, labeling. Thanks. I'm, um, I'm aware that we're now at 4.30, um, which is um, the end, or technically the end of our webinar, but I'm also aware that we have 95 open questions, which is brilliant. Um, and I wonder whether um, Mark or Danielle, we might be able to arrange some sort of live Q and A on a lot of this, um, a lot of these questions um, at, for another date. Not where we do a webinar, but we just have you know questions coming in, and we can um, we can answer them perhaps um, as well. You're always welcome to email us, Danielle. Do you want to move the, um, the slide forward just to have our contact? Um, sure. Info? Yep. Yeah, I'm just aware that um, some of us have um, sort of things to, to go on to and, and you all do as well. So, um, Mark, I didn't know whether you wanted to say anything more before we wrap up. Um, I mean, I think I think it confirms what we already know, which is there's huge enthusiasm uh, to understand this sector more, to engage with it more. And that the good news is that we have got this three year research program, which is which is both focused on, on trying to understand these research questions and do some deep science, but also interact with the public and policymakers. And so I would, I would say that we, we would aim to have some more of these in the new year, where we A, report on our progress, and B, again, try to um, may, maybe change the ratio of talking to questions <laughs> so that we can get through more questions. It's a, good, it's a learning curve for us too. So it, I think, I think now that we're all in touch with each other and you know what we're doing and um and you know how to contact us then hopefully you know we can we can all work on this together and clarify certain issues um and um keep in touch does that make sense because I, I know i think about an hour is probably about the right length of time for anyone on on screens <laughs> and um and so yeah we prom we promise a new, an, another one of these in the new year uh, and uh, we can all get together then. Um, can I just add something as well? Um, just Beth, in response to the kind of Q&A, uh, amazing Q&A list that we have, um, what we'll do is we'll just run through and we'll try and answer the range of questions that we've got remaining and put, put it out through the blog. So a format that everyone can kind of access on the internet. Um, but yeah, but we, we will try and answer them um, and get back to you. Brilliant. Well, thank you everybody for being with us. Thank you to um, our speakers and the team more widely at the hub. Um, we're really glad that everybody's so enthusiastic about the project and um, we will share a link um, to the recording of this uh, session as well um, with you after we finish today. It's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth, for, for hosting and great job, everyone. See you all. Keep well.